Hello, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to uh, this morning's event on China in 2022, looking back and looking ahead. I'm Rory Daniels. I'm the managing director of the Asia Society Policy Institute, and I'm delighted to see uh, so many of our members and friends here in the building for this, which will be our last event for the Policy Institute of 2022. And we have some excellent speakers here to talk about what has happened in China over the last year and what it might mean moving forward. Um, I'll introduce our speakers first and then uh, set the stage for us and we'll get right into questions. So first, uh, joining me on in person, we have Kevin Run, President and CEO of the Asia Society and also uh, President of the Asia Society's Asia Policy Institute. Immediately to his right, we have Bates Gill, who's the executive director of the Center for China Analysis within the Policy Institute here at the Asia Society. And joining us online, we have C. Raja Mohan, who is a senior fellow with the Asia Society Policy Institute out of our office in Delhi. Um, you all should have their bios with you, so I won't go through all of their amazing accomplishments, so we have a little bit more time for discussion. Um, but I'm very excited to have with us three people who have spent their professional careers trying to deeply understand China, its trajectory, its priorities, and its goals. Um, 2022 has been a very consequential year for China and for the world. Uh, in preparing for this event, I was going through the number of consequential events and activities that have happened in 2022 and you could almost calendar the entire year around a series of shocks um, and uh, significant events, including the Beijing Winter Olympics in February 2022. Um, immediately following that, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and for the rest of the year, even into now, the political chaos, food crisis, and energy crunch um, that that has created we're still in the midst of a global pandemic or endemic with COVID-19 continuing to spark rolling shutdowns in various industries, causing global supply chain uh, crunches and shortages. And in China, uh, a series of Omicron mini outbreaks that really tested China's zero COVID strategy um, starting in the late spring with massive lockdowns in Shanghai. Continuing into the summer, we had the visit of then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan, um, which also sparked a, a crisis in the Taiwan Strait with China uh, simulating a blockade of Taiwan and um, uh, cutting off diplomacy with the United States in areas that were not related to the security of uh, Taiwan or cross-Taiwan Strait relations. And all of this happening at a year in China where it was facing a major leadership transition in the 20th Party Congress when it presumably wanted a what it calls a benign external environment. Um, so China introduced a new slate of leaders, all of them uh, very close to and loyal to Xi Jinping himself, uh, producing what we at the Asia Society Policy Institute's Center for China Analysis have called the end of factionalism in China. And then following that, we had the return of Xi Jinping on the diplomatic stage, um, going to the G20 and major summit meetings in Asia, meeting with Joe Biden in November, um, and also meeting with major, other major global leaders to uh, you know, solidify uh, China's strategies of diplomacy and dialogue. And then after that, we have COVID, zero COVID protests in China, which have caused a very rapid loosening of China's zero COVID policies and protocols. So um, just talking about 2022, we could probably do a day long conference. We have a pretty short time here. So let me start with you, Kevin. Could you just take us through in the context of all of these events, the story of China's economy over the last year? Um, how does China assess its, its economic opportunities and challenges at home and abroad? And what strategies to manage those challenges are going to be likely given this, these new leadership appointments? I think um, when we look back on it all, uh, 2022 
if it has a three-line summary, it's um, uh, I, Xi Jinping, take total control over politics, what we saw in the 20th Party Congress. Um, uh, <clears throat> rebuild economic growth because I, Xi Jinping, have undermined the pre-existing economic growth model. And thirdly, seek to repair certain critical foreign relations, or at least stabilise them, given that they fell into disrepair in last, over the last several years. And so, um, uh, on the economy question, if I was to again give that a one or two line summary, it would be, who would have thought at the beginning of 2022 that we would now be discussing questions such as uh, is the Chinese economic growth model failing uh, and are we looking at a China which is no longer investable or uh, is the Chinese economy now peaking uh, in terms of its uh, long-term growth potential. Now, each of those is a stretch and an overreach on the reality, but um, they are nonetheless um, summary points about where we've been. So drilling down into the economy just a few steps further, I think it's a bit like this. Um, at the beginning of the year, uh, and we go to the National People's Congress in March, the growth numbers projected for the year were 5.5. Uh, that followed um, Putin's decision to invade Ukraine, which was in February. Um, but it was um, uh, more or less uh, coterminous, uh, coincidental with the launch of um, COVID lockdowns uh, across the, the Chinese economy during, frankly, the duration of 2022. And so... Almost from the get-go, the normal assumption of Chinese normal growth of 5.5, 6, 6.5 got um, thrown out the window on the basis of geopolitics abroad, that is uh, uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, and uh, COVID at home. And uh, these therefore became two huge destabilizing factors in China's overall growth <coughs> performance. The second point about the growth trajectory, however, for the year uh, is not just what I've always seen as being a temporary problem with COVID lockdown, big but temporary, um, but the more systemic problem is the erosion of business confidence. And that is the product of uh, fundamental ideological shifts uh, in uh, China's uh, overall ideological settings on the economy frankly going back to the 19th Party Congress in 2017. The re-emergence of the state uh, over the private sector, the re-emergence of the party over traditional economic technocrats, uh, the re-emergence of planning over the market, uh, the re-emergence of um, uh, the commanding heights in some respects, uh, com uh, reinforced by an ideological uh, crackdown, at least in part on the property sector, an ideological crackdown on the technology sector. And so the cumulative effect of that over some years, but almost reaching its crescendo in 2022, was uh, private sector business confidence falling through the floor. Um, so what did you have happening simultaneously? Geopolitics dampening growth around the world. Uh, you had consumer demand being crushed uh, by COVID lockdowns and you had business confidence um, being crushed by ideology and a set of policy positions on these critical sectors of the economy. So just to conclude on that, so once we got our way through the 20th Party Congress, I see uh, the Chinese leadership uh, having got politics behind us and Xi Jinping adopting this winner-takes-all approach at the Congress and emerging as numero one, numero two, and numero three, as well as four, five, six, and seven, um, uh, is you see the emergence of uh, a realization on Xi Jinping's part that his fundamental Achilles heel is where the economy has gone to. And so you see, I think, a fairly panicked move on the lift of lift lifting of zero COVID 
the plan originally was to bring China out of zero COVID by about June next year, bit by bit, city by city, having trialled the Hong Kong model. And then, bang, it turned on a dime, literally in the course of the last week or so, with the emergence of the protest uh, movement, which spooked the leadership politically, um, but also was reinforced by collapsing uh, consumption figures uh, in terms of the economic data. So Thursday of this week, literally two days from now, they convene the Central Economic Work Conference. It'll be the most viewed Central Economic Work Conference, I think, in the last couple of decades in Chinese economic history. And when I look at uh, what the media starts to be reporting on uh, what its priorities will be, uh, boosting market confidence, uh, expanding domestic demand, Boosting market confidence means rebuilding private sector confidence, expanding domestic demand, that is, the damage that's been done through zero COVID. And on the housing sector, they're likely to see the abolition of the phrase, housing is for living in, not for speculating on, um, which is Xi Jinping's ideological statement about too much, um, shall we say, uh, investment in the fictitious economy of uh, residential real estate. So, to conclude on the economy, given that's the course through the year, the question in my mind is, will it work? Because the policy shift of some description is about to unfold this Thursday. But will the private sector respond and put their hand up and say, we believe you, Uncle Xi, uh, or will they not? And on the, on the abolition of zero COVID, is it going to be a very messy process over the first six months of the year? as we see large-scale hospitalizations, potentially of old people whose vaccination rates are still abysmally low, uh, and therefore a series of stop, start, stop, start, stop, start between now and the middle of next year once you hit the summer. So, the ch in summary, a change in policy course to try and recover from the damage of the, f of the last year plus uh, and to restore growth. Secondly, an open question as to whether consumer demand will come back as rapidly as they need. It could do. Uh, and will the business community respond by saying, we're no longer going to give you a hard time? Question mark. Well, that's an impressive tour of China's governance challenges over the year, many of which have <coughs> economic implications or are uh, started through economic strategy. So we're going to return in a little bit to how China is going to deal with those challenges, and can we find some pragmatism amid this ideological push for control? Um, but I'd also like to turn to Bates here. Um, Bates, here at the Asia Society Policy Institute, you and your team have been closely tracking changes in China's leadership after the 20th Party Congress. Um, can you walk us through the context of those changes? How does China also assess its uh, opportunities and challenges? What strategies do you think China will use in the future to ad address from a political perspective some of the events that we've discussed today? Well, thanks, Rory. Um, well, as Kevin you know, mentioned, uh, I think most importantly coming out of the 20th Party Congress was a consolidation of Xi Jinping's uh, leadership, apparently. Uh, and I think that was sort of best personified, I suppose, by the individuals that he saw to uh, getting important appointments. Uh, especially on the Politburo Standing Committee. So uh, the Politburo Standing Committee, this is the seven men who uh, are at the core of the party and who, who basically have the most important portfolios, both within the party and even government leadership portfolios as well. And so they're the most powerful uh, individuals in the system. Um, she saw to it at the 20th Party Congress to sort of consolidate uh, not only his leadership, but by putting in place persons who are understood to be uh, long-time loyalists of his. So out of that seven-member body, uh, only, I think, two uh, remained, if you don't count Xi Jinping himself, only two remained from the previous 19th Party Congress, and, uh, and four new individuals were, were brought on board. Um, most importantly, I guess, would be the number, now the number two person on the Politburo, Li Chang, who is the uh, premier, replacing Li Keqiang who was the previous premier, and then three others, uh, Li Xi, Tsai Chi, and Ding Xiaxiang. All of them uh, considered members of the so-called uh, 
uh, uh, Zhejiang Xinjun, which is the uh, uh, new Zhejiang army, uh, Zhejiang being a reference to the, the province of Zhejiang, and uh, where Xi had been a leader and where many of these individuals had interacted with him and had uh, risen, risen with him. So uh, sort of packing the court, as it were, uh, for, the, for the Politburo. Uh, so that's the Politburo uh, Standing Committee. That's a very important in development, um, which in some respects I think was seen as a very triumphant uh, 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 you know, um, reinforcement of Xi's leadership, putting him in place obviously to uh, be the paramount leader for at least the next five years, if not for life. Uh, all the more surprising then, I think, um, to see the, the walk back or the, the, as Kevin said, the turn on the dime uh, in response to the uh, COVID-19 related protests, uh, which I think, as you say, did, did shake the leadership. And I think in some respects then has to have us questioning uh, just how solid uh, he actually felt, Xi Jinping, even after having uh, stacked the deck so, so strongly with people uh, loyal to him. Um, you know, all of you, you all saw the sort of unceremonious removal of, of Hu Jintao from the uh, 20th Party Congress conclusion. Uh, that was quite symbolic then of, uh, as you say, as we've said, sort of the end of factionalism within the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so that's point one, uh, solidification of his leadership, putting a lot of loyalists around him at the very, very top, which I think has implications. We, maybe Kevin and others could comment about what that's going to mean going forward in terms of policy directions. We'll, we'll get to that, I think, a little bit later. But the second thing I think was also very important coming out of this leadership transition was the emphasis that we see on security, both domestic and international, as coming to the fore and being a, a top priority now, it's, it appears, uh, for, for Xi Jinping and the new leadership coming out of the 20th Party Congress. And again, we see this uh, represented uh, not only in sort of the, the, the phrasing and the, and, and the words used uh, coming out of the Congress, uh, including from his work report, but also in the, in the people uh, who were appointed uh, to, to take over leadership coming out of the 20th Party Congress. Um, importantly, uh, you know, breaking some of the taboos or breaking some of the norms, uh, he retained on the Central Military Commission, uh, Zhang Yoxia, who at 72 years old uh, would have normally uh, been rolled off or retired, uh, but who retained his position as, the vice, as one of the vice premiers of the Central Military Commission. This has been interpreted as, as quite important uh, because uh, he is one of the few uh, leaders of the uh, People's Liberation Army who has actually seen uh, combat, um, who's actually uh, participated in combat, uh, having been uh, a part of the um, Chinese uh, ill-fated invasion of Vietnam uh, back in the late 1970s and early 1980s, um, but largely interpreted as having been a, seen, seen as a steady hand for the PLA and perhaps someone who can help advise Xi Jinping uh, on some of these important security issues going forward. Um, but also, uh, in terms of domestic security, is also obviously going to be a, a big priority, perhaps over, uh, over the importance of economic growth. And as Kevin suggests, I guess we'll see, coming out of the meeting uh, later this week, the degree to which the economy is given greater, greater priority. So those are the two things I think were important, uh, stacking the deck, uh, solidifying his leadership, and then secondly, um, giving a lot of emphasis to, the, to issues of domestic and foreign security, which we can talk about a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, you've commented frequently about how China sees a, a period of struggle ahead. And um, certainly that tracks with the events that we're seeing globally, but also the way that China has interpreted and used those events to move its own domestic policy priorities forward. Um, I'd like to turn now to Raja. Uh, Raja, uh, even though the Chinese leadership was very focused in this pandemic period on managing domestic, economic, and social issues, um, China also pressed hard on its territorial claims, notably at the border between China and India, which I'm seeing as I woke up this morning, there was a further clash 
um, happening overnight. Um, so at, especially at a time when there was an opportunity to find this kind of larger common cause with China's neighbors, um, how has China's very aggressive behavior affected India's view of its long-term relationship with China, and how has it changed India's view of engagement in the Indo-Pacific region and the role that it could play moving forward? <clears throat> I would say, I mean, the Chinese actions uh, on the border uh, last, you know, in 2020 summer in Ladakh, uh, which you which you mentioned, uh, I think helped cure India of its uh, Sinophilia uh, for a long time since India's independence. Uh, the sensibility in Delhi that we can work out a reasonable arrangement with China and that India should keep a measure of distance from the United States and the West in order to build this Asian relationship. I think those have been firmly buried thanks to Chinese actions. Uh, as you recall, we've had a series of military crises on the border 2013, 2014, not 2017, and 2020. Uh, I think the 2020 crisis uh, was serious enough, and I think we've still are to disentangle from the consequences of that. My sense is Delhi has little expectation, whatever New York uh, might think, uh, or other Chinese, those who have, uh, those who engage China, might believe that uh, China will show pragmatism uh, for its own reasons. Uh, Delhi has seen little reason uh, to bet that China will move towards pragmatism. And in fact, the incidents uh, last week, uh, which have come to light uh, in the last two days, uh, 200 Chinese armed men coming into Arunachal Pradesh, uh, this is in the eastern Himalayas, are uh, trying to alter the status quo on the border, which is what the Indians said. Uh, and Indians uh, pushed them back. Now, this was on December, December 9th. Uh, the initial reaction of the uh, MFA uh, in Beijing was that, look, uh, this is not really serious. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of those things we are in communication. But the army and the armed forces uh, in China have taken a, a far more tougher position. And my sense is beginning to ricochet uh, in the Chinese social media. Uh, I, don't, I don't think Chinese believe they owe anything uh, to their neighbors in Asia because they're very strong because they're so much more powerful than the neighbors. Uh, they think they owe very little. Uh, and that's the reason why uh, they have simultaneously taken on Japan, India, Australia, and a whole lot of countries. While there are expectations, uh, China might, uh, might change course. Uh, we saw in Bali, Xi Jinping was smiling a lot at the G20 meeting. And the change of American strategy towards engagement, that we need an engagement track, even as you confront China, uh, which is what the policy Japan, Australia, and most others have taken, uh, I think will give China the confidence or a hope at least that by doing small things, it can explore the cleavages uh, within the Western coalition and the coalition that seemed to emerge. So my sense is uh, China still has upper hand that uh, it can deal with the U.S., uh, offering it some kind of a forward moment, uh, and at the same time, uh, try to tell the neighbors that, look, uh, you have to come to terms with me on my conditions, and that don't expect the Americans uh, will, will secure you uh, all the time. So I think that's where we are. Uh, so my sense is the structural upper hand China thinks it has that it can do an independent negotiation with the Americans. We saw the European leaders uh, following uh, each other in Bali to just to shake hands with, uh, with Xi Jinping. Uh, and uh, Asians too, I mean, Australia, Japan, prime ministers met him. Uh, my sense is uh, this will give confidence to Xi uh, to explore the, 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 where the you know, divisions might be without having to do too much uh, to, to, to either side. Absolutely. I think leaders around the world are always looking to get maximum gains, right, for minimal mm -hmm. effort, and China is certainly um, no exception. But I think that what the, you know, what all of our panelists have done this morning is lay out that despite China's uh, push towards a very specific, perhaps ideologically driven, um, struggle-focused uh, you know, sense of ordering in the region that China is at the top and everybody should adjust to its priorities, it's facing a lot of consequences um, for those actions and, 
you know, I would like to run through how our panelists think China will respond to those consequences um, and whether or not there is a threshold at which we'll tend to see uh, a little bit more pragma pragmatism out of China rather than this kind of aggressive push toward everyone else adjusting to it. Um, so Raja already brought up the diplomacy that happened between Xi Jinping and Joe Biden, um, perhaps as a, a tactical maneuver, if that's a fair summary of your comments, um, in order to buy time, gain space, exploit cleavages um, among the Western coalition that is all really concerned with some of the actions that China has taken. Um, so I'd like to just get into this a little bit deeper from your perspective, Kevin. How does China balance between the goals that it has with this rigid set of priorities and principles and um, adapting to the roadblocks that these strategies often hit? The, um, I'm fascinated by what Roger had to say about um, Xi Jinping's um, strategy towards India and, uh, and certain of um, China's other neighbors uh, in Asia. And the distinction between that on the one hand and managing risk uh, with uh, the Americans and the Europeans on the other. So why don't we just start there uh, for a bit. Um, what I see, starting with the United States, is a decision in Beijing and in Washington to stabilize the U.S.-China relationship uh, in the Bali summit. And for the course of 2023, if they can, to bring the temperature down several notches. You see this uh, in the language of both sides. So the Americans have been calling for managed competition, the respect of strategic red lines, the need for strategic guardrails for some time. In other words, just to bring it down from 8 out of 10 on the Richter scale of things going wrong, down to something closer to a more manageable 5 to 6. The Chinese had not responded until quite recently, and uh, what I found fascinating about the Bali summit was the actual length of the Chinese official readout from the meeting. Like it went on for four pages. Normally a Chinese readout is about three paragraphs. We met, um, the crazy American said this, uh, we advanced a righteous cause about that, uh, and uh, we'll continue to meet and our officials will have uh, ongoing discourse, goodbye, see you later, sort of thing. This one is four pages of Xi Jinping extempore, um, and it's quite remarkable. What I found remarkable about it um, uh, is, despite certain hardline elements of it on Taiwan, was the fact that on the pure bilateral with the United States, it was calling for new protections, feng hu, uh, around the relationship, for a new security safety net underneath the relationship, a new anchen wang, um, new, new phrase, never heard that before. And then thirdly, uh, all designed to reduce the risk of crisis and conflict. Hadn't heard that before either. So, and given, uh, as Bates has correctly pointed out, the extent to which Xi Jinping uh, is now uh, the center of everything in China, even more so after the 20th Party Congress, these new phrases actually provide authorization points to the rest of the diplomatic, political and military establishment in their dealings with the Americans to bring it down a couple of notches. And I saw a report yesterday that two American officials have been dispatched uh, to China to begin the prep for the meeting by Secretary of State Blinken, which I think is about how to um, construct these sort of guardrails uh, in Fe uh, January, February next year. Flip quickly to Europe, um, and that I find doubly fascinating. Because if the interest is to bring the temperature down with the United States a couple of notches, because China has no short to medium term interest in bringing about a conflict or war with the United States by accident, like out of an incident, um, it needs time to further prepare militarily, militarily, financially and economically and technologically for its Taiwan contingencies, late 20s, early 30s in my judgment. So where does Europe fit into this? And so in Europe, I think there's a parallel interest to take the temperature down several notches. One, there's a now a realization in Beijing that Xi Jinping um, made one of two cardinal errors during the course of 2022, 
COVID we've just discussed in terms of the harshness of zero COVID lockdown and the dramatic nature of the release, frankly. But the second was um, the relationship without limits with the Russians uh, prior to the invasion of Ukraine. So suddenly China went from being perceived as a de de benign foreign policy and strategic actor in most of Europe to being malign. And if you look at the opinion polling in Europe as of uh, a month ago, suddenly China was as distrusted as the Russian Federation for the first time in decades that you see numbers like this really since Tiananmen in 89-92. So this was a massive own goal by the Chinese. So what's the, the Chinese are concerned, yes, about their reputation, but what are they concerned most about? Against Taiwan contingencies, it's a very simple question. They don't expect the Europeans to be military players in any future Taiwan contingency. But what they are concerned about is whether the Europeans join financial, economic and technological sanctions. Uh, if and when a military scenario arises over Taiwan, analogous to what we've seen deployed against the Russians over Ukraine. If the Europeans stay out of that and America is on its own, maybe with its um, Pacific allies, China concludes we can navigate that because we've still got access to global capital markets and still got access to European markets for goods and services. But if China concludes that the Europeans are going to have total seamless solidarity with the Americans, then we've got a problem. So the charm offensive launched, of course, with uh, uh, Chancellor Schultz of Germany. And now I think you'll see a series of such engagements from the Europeans is huge. And then you go back to Raja's point about, and what about the rest of us, Raja, uh, in the region? Uh, you guys, uh, front and centre, don't see a lot of uh, intentionality to bring down the temperature with Delhi at the moment. I was in Tokyo last week and speaking with the Japanese government, the intensity of activity in the East China Sea has remained constant. Uh, in fact, continues to edge up rather than edge down in terms of Chinese uh, naval and coast guard deployments in and around Sankoku Daidao. Uh, Taiwan, the intensity factor, I think, still remains. Uh, South China Sea, I don't have recent data, although there is uh, an intention to try and bring down the temperature of the relationship with Australia. So that, if you look across the spectrum, suggests different strategies for different regions with different intentionalities. But this is not inconsistent in terms of a Chinese worldview with different objectives for each part of that jigsaw. Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned, of course, China's no limits relationship with Russia, which of course hit a limit almost immediately when the sanctions were put on. And you know, we know that China as far as we know and as far as the U.S. government has been willing to say has not provided Russia with material support um, due to those sanctions. So clearly there is a way for China to pivot when the pressure comes on. Um, but what I'm hearing from your remarks is that this is consistent with China's long-term strategy and its internal uh, ideological hold on society. Um, Bates, I want to explore that a little bit further with you if I can. Um, do you expect to see any sort of flexibility or pragmatism in China? Do you agree with the rest of the panelists here that uh, flexibility and pragmatism is, you know, tactical, not strategic? Um, and should we just abandon the idea that China can maneuver beyond its ideology? Um, I'm, I'm a little more skeptical, I think, maybe, than what we're hearing so far about uh, this, this notion of pragmatism and flexibility. Yes, it's obviously some tactical uh, maneuvers at the moment to try to rebuild or um, put a floor under a, a you know, Anchuan Wang, a, a safety net beneath. All of that, we see some measures of that coming out of Xi Jinping's China today. There's some evidence, for example, uh, of, of, of reining in a bit of the so-called wolf warrior uh, um, diplomacy, uh, not quite as you know, over the top in terms of um, uh, diplomatic rhetoric in being critical of others like the United States or Western, other Western democratic nations. And so I suppose that's all to the good. It's demonstrating some, I guess the words, pragmatism um, or, or flexibility or at least uh, a little bit more, I think, uh, good sense on the part of Chinese diplomacy, uh, having recognized the damage that many of these uh, measures had, had, had made against some key relationships. But 
I, I see it as a relatively short-term um, adjustment of, of sorts, maybe uh, one step back before taking another two steps forward. Um, and the reason I think that is because uh, Xi Jinping uh, is, in my view, very, very heavily invested in this idea of achieving the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Uh, and to get there uh, between now and 2049, the 100th anniversary of the, of the People's Republic, is going to require some pretty um, aggressive uh, measures, um, especially around China's periphery. Uh, in, especially in relation to some of these um, sovereignty um, claims and disputes which China has with, with some of its key neighbors, uh, not least India, obviously, uh, uh, with Japan in the South China Sea, and of course the grandest prize of all in China's mind, um, the, um, in their view, retaking uh, of, of sovereignty over, over Taiwan. Uh, none of that's going to happen. Uh, through niceties uh, and diplomatic pragmatism. Um, that's, if, if those are to be achieved, uh, it's going to, I think, require something of a return to a more uh, assertive posture on, on China's part. So I would, I would interpret some of the charm offensive or the, the current somewhat more pragmatic or flexible diplomacy as a respite, maybe a, uh, a, a break for now. Uh, and trying to reset, recalibrate, uh, uh, re, re, uh, re, renew some of the difficult relationships that have uh, occurred, but then with the intention of going forward in a year or two's time back to a, what I would see as a little bit more uh, aggressive and assertive uh, effort on China's part to, to achieve these outcomes that they would want to see, both in terms of uh, uh, the, the sovereign claims that, that they have around their periphery, but also, as, as, as Roger was saying, in simply reasserting um, China's dominance or reasserting China's uh, power, uh, particularly around its Asian periphery. Um, Roger, I just had one, one point to that before we go to Roger. I think we're probably in basic agreement here. These adjustments that we see towards the United States, towards the Europeans, question mark towards the neighbours, because it's variable, are short to medium term. There is no, no change to China's medium to long term territorial objectives for which Taiwan remains central. And the reason why you see tactical adjustments is to enhance their position for the prosecution of the strategic objective. Where we'll have a qualitative debate is what's the timeline by which we defined short to medium term as opposed to medium to long term. I see short to medium term as anywhere between Bates's uh, couple of years through to this, the end of this uh, third term of Xi Jinping. And medium to long term is from the end of this uh, third term into his fourth. And I've always been much more worried about <coughs> Xi Jinping's fourth term, late 20s and into the early 30s, in terms of uh, where he wants to have positioned China's external relationships in the lead up to the execution of his ambitions over Taiwan, unless the United States and its allies by that stage succeed in deterring him. Sorry, I interrupted. No, absolutely. I appreciate that uh, clarification and summary here. Um, we've already got our first prediction for China's future, which is that Xi Jinping will certainly stay on uh, through a fourth term. Um, Raja, if I can just turn to you briefly, um, I'd just like to get your assessment of whether you think China will be successful in the strategy that you outlined earlier of kind of cleaving Western countries um, from each other in, in breaking lines in a coalition to manage, perhaps to um, shape China's strategic choices. Um, do you think that China can actually achieve this? Or is there an opportunity for the rest of the world to kind of keep throwing at China these um, events, scenarios, situations in which China is forced into a more pragmatic stance? Look, my sense is there are two complications uh, to the, you know, all of us are agreed here that China is making adjustments. Uh, um, we also, most of us see it as tactical or near term to 
maximize its uh, leverage and maneuvering space uh, given the difficulties it has uh, created itself. So there are two sets of problems that would come. One, the domestic politics of China, notwithstanding the presumed success of Xi Jinping at the, at the, at the 20th Congress. Uh, politics has a way of coming, keep coming back in, as we saw in the recent protests. So uh, if things go slightly all right uh, domestically, then I think his external room will begin to begin to shrink one more time. Second, I think uh, much of the world, I mean, I mean India is, is an exception. We don't have a choice to, uh, given the state of play on the, on the border. Uh, the, Kevin's idea that, look, competition must be managed, there must be guardrails. In fact, I saw Penny Wong, uh, Australian foreign minister, use that phrase the other day in a speech in, uh, in, in Washington. Uh, this gives the impression, I mean, I think uh, at the same time, the Western countries are saying, look, the conflict is structural. So what, what happens is that in the U.S., that it is not, it's one thing to say we will manage the competition, but as we know from the U.S.-Russia relationships in the past, uh, that events take place, domestic pressures build up, and the things that the U.S. does in multiple domains uh, will be seen by China as not keeping to the promise of uh, uh, building guardrails. So this notion that you can actually create a perfect conditions under a stable conditions under which uh, you know the tactical adjustments can be made i think that is there is a problem that us has domestic politics uh, us has internal contestation on the china policy there are some who are pulling towards greater engagement there are others who say we can't compromise so the us can disappoint easily uh, the 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 chinese by many of its other actions that could continue to take place. Uh, it's not that the U.S. is simply going to let the Europeans do what they want with the Chinese, uh, nor uh, the Chinese are going to stay, you know, static. Uh, Xi Jinping's visit to Middle East, they're going to try and take advantages of America's problems. So that game is not coming to an end because both sides want to build some guardrails. So therefore, my sense is there are in, there is enough room to muck up what seems to be a reasonable approach to maintain this relationship. That's exactly what happened. The detente in the 70s got undermined by the actions by either side took in the, in the turn of the 80s. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a very multifaceted problem set and it depends on the decisions and actions of the US, China, and many players around the world um, in order to come to an outcome that is maximally ideal for the most number of people, which I think would be avoiding an outright conflict or war between the two major powers, the U.S. and China. Um, but certainly underneath the surface of that, so many different strategies and tactics and events that could spoil or disrupt either side's approach to each other. Um, with all that in mind, I'm about to turn to audience questions. Please start thinking about what you might want to ask. There'll be microphones coming around. But before we do that, if I can just have a lightning round quickly. Um, just we've looked back quite a bit. Now looking ahead. This panel doesn't do lightning. <laughs> <laughs> we do Fine. rolling thunderstorms, which go on forever. So. <laughs> Could we do it in, let's say, two sentences? It's okay. a challenge. Um, okay. You're master of brevity, so I believe in you. And I'll, I'll let you go last so you can have some time to think about it. <laughs> um, so in two sentences, you know, what is your top prediction for China in 2023? Could be something that would surprise our audience, maybe something that's just particularly significant. Um, I'm going to turn to Bates first. You have two sentences. First sentence. Uh, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin McCarthy and the Republican-led uh, lower house of the United States, Congress is going to create all kinds of havoc for the U.S.-China relationship. Um, second sentence, um, watch China's efforts in the global south in 2023, precisely coming off of what Raja was saying uh, as to a um, tactical adjustment of foreign policy, finding friends and support in parts of the world where China is going to be most appreciated. There's going to be some really interesting developments there, I think, in 2023. Thank you, Bates. I'm giving you a couple of uh, semicolons <laughs> for your second sentence there. Okay, turning to Raja. No, I would, I would say fundamentally domestic politics in both the countries, that is U.S. and China, are major variables. 
uh, which is what we've seen in the last decade. And the intensity of that variability uh, in both the countries is high. Therefore, I would say keep your fingers crossed. Uh, don't bet on clear-cut outcomes because uh, Chinese politics and the U.S. politics both are structurally unstable. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, turning to you. Uh, one, Chinese property sector will recover in 2023. Two, by the end of 2023, we will be debating the possibility of a Chinese financial crisis coming out of excessive leverage being re-delivered to the property sector to generate growth. So both uh, an opportunity for China in um, trying to boost some domestic consumption, but also a major liability at the same time. Okay, with that, um, I'd love to turn to audience questions. Please raise your hand. A mic will come to you. I wonder if you could comment on the idea that perhaps China might be interested in some of Russia's land that's thawing out and perhaps could be used for increased agriculture. Well, there's a doozy. The, um, the, uh, a, we have no evidence of that. So B, we are left in the area of speculation. But. Uh, Scientific studies within China itself have mapped carefully the impact of climate change on China's arability um, and, its, and the future of its agriculture, particularly on the North China Plain. It would therefore not surprise me if there were contingency plans somewhere in the Chinese system to lease slabs of land in the Russian Far East for agricultural purposes as that land becomes more amenable for agriculture. Um, of course, it would be a great historical coincidence if the areas leased happened to coincide with those parts of Russia uh, which Russia, the Russian Empire took from China uh, in the uh, unfair treaties uh, of the 19th century. But that would be interesting to observe in reflection. I like this idea that no limits might also mean no borders, right? <laughs> um, next question, please, in the back here with the red hat. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Valdas. Uh, I am uh, curious to get your thoughts, Mr. Mohan, about uh, how is India then visualizing over the short term how it is going to position itself vis-a-vis that differentiated approach that China is taking to its neighbors in the region. Thank you. I think the near-term strategy is set for India that uh, it is going to try and uh, strengthen its partnership with the United States, uh, with Japan and other allies of the United States. It's also reaching out to Europe uh, to, to strengthen its uh, position vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, uh, that India has a stake now higher than ever before in the last 75 years since India's independence, uh, to balance China. And, and I think uh, whatever the other actors might do, uh, India's karma, shall we say, is now to really find whatever means it can to, to balance China, given the, the fundamental nature of the threat uh, it faces uh, from China. Second, I would say that uh, uh, over the longer term, uh, that uh, India needs to take advantage of the uh, strategies of different countries on the economic side, on the China plus one. We're we'll beginning to see a little bit on that. I mean, the Apple's production of iPhones in India probably is one example. But there's a lot more. If India can make its own uh, ease of doing business, uh, more, ref more reforms internally, my sense is uh, it will try and accelerate its own growth at a time when China is uh, slowing down. Uh, but that's a longer-term strategy. And third, to, to be an actor within the region, to find constantly opportunities within the region uh, to, to strengthen coalitions uh, beyond the Quad uh, with, the, with other countries, with France, uh, with uh, other developing countries. So in order to, uh, to blunt some of uh, China's advantages that have emerged in the developing world that Bates had talked about. Hey, Rory, can I cheat and have a third prediction? 
You can. Is Thank it going to be two sentences? It'll be one sentence, but Perfect. a long one. All right. Okay. <laughs> and it's, it's really cheating because, uh, because Rogers reminded me of what my prediction should have been, which is watch carefully Modi's G20 summit in Delhi come November as a major opportunity for India to repitch to the world as the China plus one alternative for supply chains geopolitically and environmentally as he seeks to green the energy, uh, uh, the Indian uh, energy network. Yeah, and please follow Asia Society for more info on that as well as we'll be spending a lot of time in the next year on G20 and also on um, India's energy market development. I want to take two questions at once now because we're running low on time. I have this gentleman right here and right over here. So, um, and thanks to all of the questioners for also being incredibly brief. Hi, Kevin. I really uh, like your outlook about Xi Jinping's fourth term, even though we are still in 2022. And you just mentioned that you, uh, you visited Tokyo recently. I don't know whether you're aware that Japanese, you know, every year they choose the Chinese character for the year. And this year they choose the, the war. Okay, the Chinese character war is the uh, stand for this year. So the common say, you know, this about uh, Russia, Ukraine, that's about North Korea. Mm. And uh, some common say maybe Japan, Japan is prepared for the war for China because China possibly is prepared for something about Taiwan. I know you spent time in Taiwan. Can you comment more about um, Taiwan in year? 2023, or maybe up to Xi Jinping's possible fourth term. Okay, great. So we've got Taiwan in 2023, um, up to Xi Jinping's fourth term. Let's take this other question, and we'll just go through the speakers really quickly. Good morning. Um, on the basis of sort of the near and far, when the United States exited Afghanistan in August of 21, has there been any um, malfeasance done since that time by China in terms of working with the Taliban to take extract precious um, rare earth minerals. That's on the one hand. On the other, um, the Honorable Kevin Rudd, has the export of um, hard durables, um, coal, uh, et cetera, coming out of Western Australia, has that regularized itself with China? And how has the relationship evolved? Thank you. Okay, great. So we now have Taiwan in 2023, a fourth term for Xi Jinping, China in Afghanistan, and also uh, Western Australia, China, um, ener or, sorry, mineral sector. Um, are, if, are we running short of time? Why don't you we collect are. a few others? Okay, wonderful. And then we'll, who we'll, else we'll give like haiku responses. This? All right, I'm going to run out of the um, ability to summarize, but please let's go right here in the front and then uh, take one in the back as well. Uh, perhaps Frank after. Go ahead. Do you think that Xi Jinping will pay any price reputationally for his about face on COVID? And if so, will there be evidence of that that we can see domestically or globally? Thank you. And one more question here from. Uh, okay. Good morning. I'm Dr. Marguerite Said. I, I was in Myanmar, in northern Myanmar. Uh, the whole area has been taken over by China. I went into the IDP camps, and, and uh, I saw what has happened. They have taken all their land, displaced over a million people, and planted bananas in, in, in the war region with the, all the drug trade that we have. The methamphetamine is a major problem in the world. Okay, great. And just one final question here from Frank, who is... Yeah, thank you. Just real quickly, a follow-up to the one on COVID. The question I would have, the really drastic difference between the government approach to protest in 89 versus over the last few months, and is that strategic on Xi Jinping's part to boost the economy, get the, get the respect of the people and the support of the people to drive the economy forward? Okay, great. Um, so Kevin, I'm going to turn to you maybe particularly on Taiwan in 2023 um, and Western Australia. Bates, if you want to take on uh, Xi Jinping's reputation, um, et cetera. And then, um, if I could, Raja, turn to you for China and Afghanistan. Perhaps in all of South Asia would be of interest to this group. Yeah. Um, and sorry, Kevin, if I didn't mention Western Australia as well. 
start with Kevin. Okay. Taiwan, the DPP candidate is likely to be the current vice president. Um, and based on the um, conversations I've had with people who are familiar with his posture on Taiwan independence, he's likely to be cautious uh, in the language and um, that he deploys uh, not to the satisfaction of Beijing, but not going beyond the line already put in the sand by uh, Tsai Ing-wen. So no restoration of what's called <coughs> Taiwanese acceptance, the 1992 consensus, um, but not going further than where Taiwan is at present. We don't know who the KMT candidate will be. Any assumption from the local government elections which have just been held that the KMT is on a roll and will definitely win um, is heroic because the KMT did very well four years ago in the local government elections as well and uh, were absolutely smashed in the presidential and congressional elections. Uh, a footnote on that because it was in the question about uh, looking at Japan. Uh, as I said before, I was just in Japan very recently. In terms of a big change, the Japanese government has announced a doubling in Japanese defence expenditure in five years. So really watch this closely. Between 2022 and 2027, there is a proposal which they are determined to deliver on to increase Japanese defence <coughs> expenditure from something like uh, 65 billion US a, a year to 130 billion. This, this makes Japan the third largest military power in the world. This is a big new dynamic unfolding. Um, Western Australia, uh, iron ore trade was never disrupted uh, with China. The coal trade out of Queensland was, uh, but it has been slowly normalised. The, however, the formal sanctions imposed by China against Australia uh, over the Australian government's position on the global inquiry into the origins of COVID remain in place. Watch this space. If uh, Xi Jinping doesn't use the 50th anniversary of the Australia-China diplomatic relationship on the 23rd of December to do something dramatic on this. Well, uh, yeah, thanks very much. Um, I, I think Xi Jinping's reputation has already been damaged. I mean, I, I would think it was, it's, it, it was already coming into some question even before the protests, obviously. It, it, I think it in part spurred some of the protesters to come out on the street and, and vocalize as they did, even for some s small number, calling for his resignation. So, uh, you know, I think there were already difficulties with his reputation afoot. The problem is, of course, you know, how does that actually get... Uh, um, actioned in any way that's uh, impactful. And I don't think we should believe that they're necessarily coming out of those protests any sort of fundamental or existential threat to his continued uh, leadership. Um, and that gets a little bit to the question raised about the COVID-19 response. Um, you know, obviously, the ability of the Chinese state uh, to surveil and watch and understand developments within society is far, far more powerful today than it was in 1989. And I think uh, probably allowed for a degree of um, restraint uh, by, the, by the authorities in not having to take you know, the ultimate action of, of, of use of violent and deadly force. Um, but I think, too, the nature of the protests were also somewhat uh, different. Uh, in, in, in that they didn't lead to over overuse of violence on the part of the um, on the part of the citizenry themselves, so uh, it definitely damaged to, to Xi Jinping, um, but I don't think it's going to fundamentally undermine his leadership going forward. But um, but we'll see. Um, I think this next year or two is going to be very very important to see whether he's able to put in place reasonable policies that are going to stoke the kind of economic growth that's obviously going to be so necessary for all the other uh, aims and goals which he has put forward. One last comment, if I could, um, and this gets back to my point about watch this space in, in, the, in the global south. Um, you know, the recent uh, China-Arab state summit, uh, which took place the, the first ever, that's going to be taking place probably now on a, on a more regular basis, is just one more indicator of how China is trying to in, engage multilaterally with different parts of the world. Um, and coming out of that China-Arab summit was a statement on Afghanistan, uh, which perhaps uh, Raja could speak to, uh, which lays out an eight-point plan where China and Arab states are going to work together to try to help redevelop 
uh, Afghanistan and, and try to stabilize it. I don't think there's any mention in there, but, however, about rare earths. But nevertheless, it's one more, um, I think, signal, and let's hear more from Raja, about how China is going to be working very hard uh, within the global south to try and repair and build up uh, a lot of relationships there as an alternative to or a counterbalancing to what have become such strained relationships with other major players like the United States, Europe, and Japan. Thank you, Bates. Raja? Yeah, I, I just let me say uh, three, four quick things. I mean, I think on Afghanistan, when the U.S. left uh, in August uh, 2021, uh, it, I think, gave probably a lot of false uh, belief in, in Moscow and Beijing that on the U.S. decline and uh, all that stuff. But a year later, uh, both China is having serious problems to really make headway with the Taliban. Taliban has done nothing to stop support for the for the you know with the Islamic groups. Uh, Pakistan, which is supposed to be China's close ally in winning over Afghanistan, is having trouble itself uh, with the Taliban. Uh, Taliban is improving relations with, with India. Uh, and they're doing city cooperation with, with the United States. So in some ways, the U.S., by cutting its losses, actually has a leverage today, and it can play the regional balancing game far more sophisticated manner. Uh, including potentially trying to limit how far Pakistan goes uh, towards uh, towards China. So I think by lifting itself out of the trap, uh, U.S. has much more room to play. And the Chinese are discovering the difficulties uh, of uh, doing business with, uh, with the Taliban. And I think uh, uh, there's been no real progress on any of the, uh, the big ideas that China would simply march in with its uh, you know, capital and simply take out Afghan's resources. So we are not there yet. And I think there's a lot more uh, difficulty there. In uh, Burma and Myanmar, the Chinese influence has certainly grown. And partly, I think, because the U.S. has, you know, is now trying to isolate Burma uh, for whatever reasons, I mean, for questions of democracy, Burma is also having problems with ASEAN. Uh, traditionally, it should have been uh, wishy-washy about it, but they're taking a tough position. This, I think, leaves the Burmese totally dependent on the Chinese. So in the near term, I think the Chinese influence will grow. But my sense is, uh, don't assume for a moment the Burmese are simply going to roll over and let the Chinese walk all over them. I think they're in a difficult position. They do play tactical games. And uh, my sense is uh, that the xenophobia, nationalism uh, in Burma is, is second to none in Asia. So none of us in Asia, uh, I mean, uh, can say only Chinese are nationalists, all of us are nationalists. So my sense is there is enough agency still in Burma to play the game. And secondly, by letting loose the ethnic forces in northern Burma, uh, Thais have a stake in there, Indians have a stake there. So you're going to see a lot more messiness out there. And some of it could, could go and bite back, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that, use the old phrase, uh, Yunnan is a present house of nationalities. It's a game. It can be played by many people that once you start playing the arming the ethnic groups, uh, we've seen that happen in Afghanistan. We've seen it happen elsewhere. So my sense is northern Burma is ripe for uh, a, a, a contestation, which I think uh, will not be automatically uh, beneficial for the Chinese. Finally, I would say Chinese have not at all been generous to Sri Lanka, unwilling to take haircuts, unwilling to let the IMF move in and resolve the problem. So Chinese have shown no real generosity uh, or even pragmatism, I would say, in addressing uh, Sri Lanka's problem. So my sense is if the U.S. you know, gets off its ideological high horse. I mean, different administrations have different, uh, what's it, different strokes for different folks, but all of them seem to buy this democracy stuff. But I think you saw in the Middle East, uh, U.S. has lost ground by framing foreign policy, regional policies, and ideological issues. But my sense is, if it has to compete with China, there will be opportunities. A U.S. that becomes more pragmatic uh, has still enormous room and capability to offer stiff competition to China's potential forays uh, into the into the developing world and the global south. So I would say the game is just beginning. Thank you, Raja. I really appreciate you wrapping us up by reminding us that there is you know, very little market for ideology of any type in, in the world. Um, but what countries are seeking are these practical and pragmatic approaches to helping them also resolve their problems. Um, we've covered a lot of ground today. We've talked a lot about the damage done over the year. Um, 
to China and uh, some of its opportunities and challenges in both tactical sense and over the long term to repair some of that damage um, and how you know the interaction between China and the rest of the world will ultimately decide where these outcomes end up. Um, are we headed towards future conflict um, and perhaps confrontation and war, or are we headed more towards uh, diplomacy in the short term at least? Um, I want to thank our panelists for joining me today. And um, before I close, let me just remind everybody in the room and watching online that we'll be hosting a number of programs on these issues throughout 2023. Um, the U.S. is hosting APEC, the uh, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Group, this year in 2023. We'll start our two, uh, 2023 programmatic season with, at the Policy Institute with a program on U.S. APEC on January 10th. Um, please visit our website, asiasociety.org, to find all of our events programs. Sign up for being a member. And with that, please join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you.